Coming up on TechZilla, I got a new router. Where's my network speed? Another story of hard drive mayhem. Is it DLNA or your file formats? We got a ton of your viewer questions, so pop open a box of Junior Mints or Jujubes, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by Verizon 4G LTE, the largest, most advanced 4G network in the world. Go to Assist Express, support smarter with Go to Assist Express. Netflix, go to netflix.com slash TechZilla to get a free trial membership. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to TechZilla. Hands-on reviews, the latest tech, and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best place to buy skis online, We've got an answer for you. Or at least Serafina does. Hey, <laughs> if we don't, we'll track down somebody who does. The crew here at Revision 3 wanted to make a difference this holiday season, so we partnered up with Charity Water, and you guys have been amazing. Yeah, clean water is one of the scarcest resources in the world, and nearly a billion people don't have access to it. Charity Water builds wells, and they donate all, 100% of the money they raise to build wells and bring clean water to the communities in need. Texilla crew has raised almost five thousand dollars another 700 bucks we can build a well and provide water to a village for a lifetime every show on revision 3 is reaching out to viewers to raise money to build wells we need your help to make a difference please go to revision3.com slash charity water to learn more and help bring clean water to people in need on a less serious note yeah you were emailing this weekend about ebooks I <laughs> I got a Kindle as an early Christmas present, and I'm loving it, man. I just I, I am like going through all the public domain books right now, and just downloading like a madman. I have far more text than I can possibly read at the minute, but or at the moment. But uh, I'm gonna burn through them. I'm gonna get through it. I'm I'm a I'm a reader once again. Oh my goodness. Digitally now. He will be more of a reader now because Google eBooks is launching a Google bookstore. Or I should say eBook store. I, it's actually good. It's good. Competition is good. Makes for cheaper prices. And Google has pretty much the recognition of an Amazon, or at least more. Google calls it the largest eBooks collection in the world. More than three million titles, including hundreds of thousands, for sale. Hopefully, the ones for sale don't include titles available for free from the Gutenberg Project, which is something I've seen. Uh, over and over again, where it's like you could download it for free from the Gutenberg Project or pay for it, branded on somebody else's ebook website. Hey, Google says they've designed their ebooks to be open, and while the Kindle doesn't work with Google's ebook e store, oh, unfortunately, the Nook, Sony's Reader, iOS, and Android devices, and pretty much anything that can open up a web page can work with Google's new store. Now we just got to compare the prices between Google's ebook store and Amazon for the Kindle and the New York Times bestseller list. I like competition. Yes, especially for printed word. Well, in this case, digitally oh, that's true. exposed word. <laughs> E-ink printed, no, not even close. Just yeah, start with Gutenberg.org. <laughs> AT&T is the worst carrier? I agree. Well, it's not me making this claim. <laughs> it's Consumer Reports 2009 survey of cell phone service. Actually, it's not quite the worst. Apparently, there's a one carrier with a lower ranking. The top ranked carrier, and I've got to say, I picked this story before I found out they were an advertiser, Verizon. Ranking categories included no service, dropped calls, data texting, and I suppose vocal voice cell phone phone call quality. Yeah, that could be among the various things. Hey, do you have a fancy new HDMI cable there? I do have a fancy new HDMI cable. Uh, if you've never seen a swivel cable, and, and it's not like these are the newest thing on the planet. If you've never seen one of these, if you're basically dealing with a shallow media cabinet or you're dealing with a bunch of cables where like you find your cable and you push it back on your shelf and the cable's bent like this. This is bad. Not so much that it's going to tear apart the cable, but it'll tear it apart the HDMI port in the back of your device. Doesn't matter whether it's a Blu-ray player or television. These things are pretty slick. Um, this is uh, Excel's Pro Ultra Supreme High Speed HDMI Swivel Cable with Ethernet, uh, which is a very long name for a $20 HDMI cable. 20 bucks online for one meter, about 27 for three meters. Uh, Ethernet is an optional HDMI uh, Ethernet channel if you have a device that supports it. Uh, if you do, wonderful. If you don't, you probably won't no. notice. <laughs> that also supports the audio return channel that a lot yeah. of the new TVs I'm seeing are uh, featuring, so you don't have to run that optical cable out from the TV's tuner into your AVR nice. if you don't want to anymore. 
Yeah, it's yeah. the swivels though that I love. There's a lot yeah. of different brands of swivel cables out there. They may look a little chintzy in the package, uh, but you can really try. I, I've used several different brands with great luck. Excel has really, really, really good feedback on Amazon.com, and products that suck usually don't. That's about the only cable I would spend probably. Uh, a tip like that might be a reason I'd spend more than $10 on an HDMI cable. And where do we buy HDMI cables for $10? I buy them on Amazon <laughs> or online or mono price or, you know, even support your local businesses too. Yeah. Just not for those $175 uh, no. uh, monster no, cables. No cable that's worth a hundred. Well. Which brings me to something. I've gotten a bunch of, <laughs> of Twitters about this and emails. Beats by Dr. Dre is not a monster product, not the HP notebooks. People have been like, how can you recommend monster? It's like oh. Beats is actually owned, I believe, by Dre and his record company. It's just monster licensed that licensed for their headphones. The headphones are definitely a monster product. The HP notebooks, not a monster product. Uh. Just Time for laying that out there. A little questionage, maybe? Hey! <laughs> Mark writes in from Michigan. Per your recommendation, I found a Blu-ray player with DLNA so I can watch you guys along with my other iTunes and Windows Media Center content in my living room. I went with Sony's BDP BX57, a nice piece of hardware, by the way. Unfortunately, it's restricted to MP3 audio, JPEG still pictures, and MPEG2 video. Arrgh! <laughs> maybe reading this on air will embarrass, coerce, cajole, or any other expletive Sony into expanding this list. If ever there was need for a dictatorship, surely the realm of media standards is ripe for the picking. Quote, the great thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. Uh, quote, unattributed. As always, I will continue to watch and learn from my computer for now. Mark in Madison Heights, Michigan. Yeah, well, one of the things about DLNA, and apparently it is working fine, yeah. the problem I always run into is, like you've noticed, the lack of file format support. Yeah, DLNA is a networking support, and it's a, it's a pretty good dictatorship because DLNA devices, they plug into your network, they find each other, they make happy. Your content, though. Yeah, but the, the, the group, the alliance, the Digital Living Network Alliance, uh, they actually have a list yeah. of formats, and only, only a handful are mandatory. There are a lot of optional formats, mm -hmm. and it'd be nice if they just said, finally, Let's just make it all mandatory, because it isn't that hard nowadays to do this sort of thing. Now, one way to make those other file formats work with your DLNA device is to use a DLNA media server software, uh, a type of software that's included, uh, that includes a transcoder. Uh, there's a couple of great options out there. A free option would be something like PS3's media server software, which is a free package. Uh, it works with more than just PlayStation 3s. Tiversity is also another free application that does transcoding for your DLNA compliant devices, which is really nice. And there's some paid options too. I've experimented with something called Twonky. Twonky. Twonky Media Server back in the day. Uh, I think I picked it up for about 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a server function, a transcoder function that's compatible with Apple and Windows and right. Linux, and they also have just a standalone Windows program as well. So, but yeah. that's paid. So I try some free options first just to see if it works. But essentially, you need something that transcodes whatever file type you want into something that's going to be compatible for your DLNA streaming experience. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect Sony to upgrade like MPEG-4 and other formats because MPEG-4 requires a lot of horsepower, and you don't necessarily. It, it, I would be curious. You know, well, it's a Blu-ray player, so it should be able to decode MPEG-4. Okay, so yeah, keep harshing on Sony and tell them to write the software. Just don't ever expect to find a way to play, uh, you know, DRM locked content nah, from iTunes on anything other than an Apple product. Coming up next, we're going to solve network speed problems, and we're going to, well, save files. But first, let's thank one of our sponsors, Verizon 4G LTE. With wireless speeds that are up to 10 times faster than 3G, Verizon's 4G LTE means you get reduced lag time and increased real-time responsiveness. Experience video conferencing without jitter or stutter, stream videos without annoying buffering, and download a song in just four seconds. But Verizon's 4G LTE also means fast upload speeds. 10 megabyte PowerPoint presentations can be uploaded in less than 25 seconds and photos in just six seconds. Verizon's 4G LTE gives you wireless options for a previously wired world. So untether yourself from your wired network and check out Verizon's 4G LTE today. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Photoscape. If you're looking for a powerful, full-featured digital image editor but don't really need all the pro bells and whistles that you get with Photoshop, check out Photoscape. As a photo editor, Photoscape lets you crop, resize, do red eye removal, and simple brightness and color correction. But if you're more adventurous, you can take advantage of filters, the clone tool, you can add text, create animated GIFs, merge and combine photos, and batch edit multiple photos. And while the interface might be a little unorthodox, it's friendly to experienced and novice users alike. So if you need an image editing app that doesn't require a college course to understand and doesn't skimp on features, check out Photoscape. 
Al writes in with another story of hard drive mayhem. Hi gang, I'm hoping you can help me. We have a large external USB drive we move around for backups, mass storage, you know the idea. My son wanted to know if he could attach it to his Xbox 360 for storage, so we tried it. We got a prompt, the Xbox will create a 16 gigabyte partition on this drive. We clicked OK. Then we found out that the Xbox had removed all other partition info, so now the drive looks like a 16 gigabyte drive and not our old 500 gigabyte drive. Dope. As soon as we realized what happened, we unplugged everything and the drive has been untouched since. All this happened in a few seconds, so I'm confident the drive was not formatted. Is there any way to get the old partitions back? Thanks, Al in Ackworth, Georgia. So, if by the old partitions you mean all the files you could see on that 500 gigabyte drive before you partitioned it and made them go away, check out revision3.com slash techzilla slash boxy and look for save the wedding photos, save a marriage. Veronica and I give you a laundry list of tools you can use to salvage photos off the drive. Since you didn't format it and haven't used it since, there's a really good chance that all of the data that was on that drive is still there. See, what you did was create uh, basically a 16 gig partition that's used only by the Xbox 360. Yeah. Now, this format is designed to allow Xbox users without a hard drive to make use of USB flash drives as primary storage for things like gamer tags or digitally protected content like movie rentals, yeah. music purchases, and of course, purchase downloaded games. Unfortunately, Microsoft only allows up to 16 gig partitions. Why? I, I did something similar a couple of years ago. I had a few external hard drives connected simultaneously to my workstation. <laughs> and I, I quick formatted a drive, and it turns out, of course, that was the wrong drive. I didn't mean to format that one. I wanted to format another one, but I didn't do a full format. So I knew the data was still there, much like your situation. In a minor panic, uh, due to a looming deadline, I just splurged 50 bucks on a Cronus's disk director software that includes the company's recovery expert tool. It was fast and easy to use. And once I finally calmed down and took a look at some of the free options that were out there, I had a little more time to actually take a peek. The GNOME Partition Editor, or Gparted for short, is available as a live CD or a USB boot key that you can create. And it's one of the most oft-recommended partition tools that works with most popular file systems that are out there. And because it's a boot key or CD, you don't have to worry about the operating system choice that you're currently working with. Another option was Partition Wizard's Home Edition. It's a freeware tool that works with Windows, Windows only on this one, and it looked fairly easy to use as well. However, there's really no substitute for backing up your yeah. data. I, I, that is just such a clutch moment when you know something went awry and the yeah. data you depend on is just not available. Backup at home, backup on a drive that's not connected to your home network, backup on a drive that's out in the, the cloud. I mean, just backup, 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 Cobalt, Mosey, whatever you want to use. Backup, backup, backup. It is easy. And easy to do up. it now <laughs> rather than pay for it later. We got more coming up, like how to speed up your router. But first... Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, GoToAssist Express. Trying to help someone through a technical issue over the phone can be a nightmare. And the last thing you want to do is waste time driving or flying to fix the problem in person. I have the perfect solution for you. Go to Assist Express. It's the easiest and most affordable way to remotely view and control another computer. You can see and solve the problem without being there in person and you'll amaze the customers by solving problems on the spot. You can even provide service when the customers are away from their computer. Techzilla viewers can try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. All you need to do is visit GoToAssist.com slash Techzilla. That's GoToAssist.com slash Techzilla for a free trial. Hey, Keith wants to know where his network speed is. He writes, hey guys, I recently purchased an N gigabit router so I can get some better streaming out of my new laptop that has a Wi-Fi N adapter. The speeds I'm getting are just like when I had my wireless G router. Downloading music and even pictures seems slower than it was before, slower. When I set up the router, I did use Windows 7 simple router setup instead of the CD it provided. I did also still set up the network with WPA2 Personal for some security, but my computer still caps out at 130 megabits per second. Where's the 300 megabits per second that I bought? Did I do something wrong when I set it up? Please, any help on the subject is appreciated. If it's any help, my ISP is Comcast and I'm using a cable modem. Thanks. Love the new double dose of the show. Signed, Keith in Laurel, Maryland. Hmm. Dun, 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 dun. Well, if you're downloading music and photos off the internet, I wouldn't expect much of an improvement f by going from G to N. Yeah. The bottleneck on download performance is usually on the server you're downloading from and not your internet connection itself. Uh, the server inside your house should see a performance boost with a faster router. 
I mean, should. Should. I mean, assuming your server can serve data that fast, right? Because you got to think, like, we have these really huge pipes, like SATA is a huge pipe, you know, Gigabit Ethernet is a huge pipe. But if you're feeding it, you know, if you're feeding a giant sewer drain that's six feet across with a single bucket, you're really not going to take advantage of the extra capacity of that totally. sewer drain. Or if you know? you're dealing with a 10 or a 20 megabit download stream for your internet connection, right. that's it. It isn't going to somehow mag magically turn yeah. into a gigabit connection to the internet at least through your even by upgrading your Wi-Fi router. Yeah, so. if you do think it's in, try using the gigabit ethernet connectors on the router. Connect that to your notebook. If you get the same speed downloading over the ethernet as you do Wi-Fi, it's the internet. It's capped by the server speed or your ISP speed. If it magically speeds up, I'd make sure you have B and G turned off in your Wi-Fi configuration in your new router. Mixed modes networks like B and G and G and N, they perform to the lower spec, not the new faster one. Basically, combining G and N slows down everything on your home network. It slows it down to G speeds. Um, turning off like B or G support on an N network can make a big difference. That didn't do it? Try WPA or turning WPA and WPA2 off, see if the speeds bump up. And as always, make sure there's not like, you know, other people downloading while you're running these tests. Totally. <laughs> I would love to see the performance difference between having the encryption on versus off, like I, like I typically run my own system at home. It so. can vary a lot with the router and the computer. Some chipsets actually have like WPA2 decryption built into the chip and nice. when they offload it from like your hardware CPU. Hardware accelerated encryption features. Yeah, that can make a big difference, especially at the router size. So if none of those work, um, seriously, if it's if it's if you're downloading off the internet, you're probably not going to see a speed boost from N. If you're downloading files inside your home, like big file transfers, you should see a speed yeah. difference if it's an N-only network and it properly handles WPA to encryption. Totally. Now, off topic, but I've also replaced a couple of my cable modems over the years, too, and it had significant speed bumps or yeah. boosts along the way. Not, not huge, but it was also about... Noticeable. Yeah, noticeable. And it also eliminated a lot of dropped performance I was having, too. Suddenly, my internet connection just died, say, every night <laughs> at 2 a.m. for some reason, which, while I'm up at 2 a.m. surfing the web, who knows? But... Oh, I know. It was nice, though, once I got a new modem, it, that, all those problems went away. And the combination with the new modem and the new router just seemed to solve all my problems. And speed was, speed was good, especially yeah. over end performance. <laughs> Sometimes being the squeaky wheel will also help. Call up your, your cable company, see if they have something better for you. Next is an email from Mark who writes in asking, Audible books have been a real lifeline for my father who suffers from a variety of disabilities. He's having a more and more or he's having more and more difficulty using MP3 players with microscopic indent controls that he can hardly feel or manipulate. Do you have any suggestions for a device or form factor that has larger usable buttons or sliders? Sign Mark. Uh, I've actually heard uh, folks with rheumatoid, or sp rheumatoid arthritis specifically and other um, you know, problems that dull manual dexterity and make it more difficult to feel things, manipulate things, have a lot of success using touch screens, uh, specifically touch screens on the iPad. Works pretty well for toddlers too who, are, who don't actually have a lot of manual dexterity. My son trying to use a mouse is a sort of a nightmare experience, but he can poke at things on a screen. If that's not portable enough, maybe an iPod Touch or one of Android's tablets running Audible software. Um, it depends, you know, too, on your mobility, though, yeah. because sometimes the touch might be just a little too small, especially, and to manipulate the volume control or to bring it up on the screen. If, if you can't hit something accurately, mm -hmm. that, that could be a challenge, and I would prefer yeah. a bigger screen of something like an iPad and for that. One of the things you can do also, if you don't like the, like the, for example, I'm going to say Audible again because I know so many people that use Audible quite happily. You know, you can try Audible's iPhone software. If you can download the iPhone software, the iPad, and double it in size, that might actually help the, the double interface. But um, yeah, tiny buttons on tiny devices can be a great big nightmare. I'd be curious to know if people are shopping around for these products out there. If there, if there are a line of MP3 players or audio players that have, you know, Usability is a prime factor with big buttons or something. Well, the, the, like the jitterbug. There's an or entire line control. of cell phone remotes that, that are or cell phones that are dedicated towards seniors or folks oh, totally. who have trouble with small buttons. Totally. Um, something. It's got to be something like that out there. And if you have that, yeah. do send us an email, Texilla at revision3.com. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. After the break, we're going to dogpile on some more viewer questions. But first, let's thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. As a Netflix member, you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC, Mac, or right to your TV via a Netflix-ready device like the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii console. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. Watch as many movies as you want, shipping is free, and there are never any late fees or due dates. 
keep the movies for as long as you like. DVDs by mail, plus instant streaming right to your TV. Get unlimited movies two ways for one low monthly price. As a new member and TechZilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash TechZilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so that they know we sent you. <laughs> hey, Jay recently emailed us asking, I recently purchased a Keydex PCI Express 1X USB 3.0 card and a Seagate Free Agent GoFlex 1 terabyte USB 3.0 external hard drive. My PCI Express is plugged into the Four, into a 4X slot on my motherboard because I don't have any 1X slots remaining or left. After installing everything, I was able, I was getting at most 53.3 megabytes per second transfer rate. How come I'm not getting the full speed? Does it have anything to do with the fact that I'm plugging in the PCIe 1X on a 4X slot? I remember Patrick mentioning a couple of episodes back saying that he is already using USB 3 and he was getting the full speed. Please help me solve my problem. Signed J in California. In terms of 1X versus 4X versus 16X slots, you shouldn't be seeing any performance difference on these. Basically, uh, some people have done a bunch of testing. I, I, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the, the site that did it. But they found out they, they started moving their cards around, and their PCI Express cards around in different slots, and you know, the number, it didn't make any difference. There's so, plenty of bandwidth on those ports to be able to handle that kind of data transfer. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, did you try plugging that drive into a USB 2.0 port and timing a transfer and comparing it to USB 3.0? You're not going to see a 10x performance improvement, um, but you should see around a 3, 3.5x three performance improvement. The most dramatic difference, by the way, flash media, SSD drives or yeah. big thumb drives, which can move data much faster because you can pull more data off of it. You know? uh, and seeing that you're getting the full, well, getting 53.3 megabytes per second transfer speeds, I, I would argue that you are indeed getting the full speed, and by that I mean the full speed of your hard drive, a uh, 53.3 megabyte per second write performance isn't bad. Now, yeah. although USB 3 is spec for data transfer speeds up to about 4,800 megabits per second or about 572 megabytes per second, your drive isn't, and those are theoretical limits anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and like Pat said, a flash drive would move that data much faster, or if you could somehow hook a RAID array up through a USB port, you could probably <laughs> saturate that port a little bit better. Oh, those are coming. And, and don't assume that whatever device you'll plug into a USB 3 port will automatically be transferring at full speed, 4,800 megabits per second. That, that just isn't the case, and you'll always be limited by the slowest speed of the device in the link. And in your case, it's, it's truly the hard drive. Yeah. And really, USB 3 was designed with that idea, uh, with the idea of having uh, multiple high-speed devices connected at the same time. And so that, that overhead, well, not overhead, but just you have plenty of bandwidth available there. You just need to connect more devices. Yeah, I will say the faster your device is, the more likely it is to take advantage of USB 3.0. Um, I've, I've found it running faster. Your mileage may vary, but it should be about three times as fast. I would, seriously, do me a favor, take that drive, time like a big file transfer over the USB 3.0 port, over the USB 2.4, do 2.0 port, uh, it should be faster. Write times also in USB 3.0 should be faster than USB 2.0, generally speaking. Cool. Hey, TechZilla viewer Sean writes in, I'm looking to turn an older dual-core PC into a NAS, network attached storage, using your suggestion a free NAS to host all of my movie library, music files, and family photos. I started my window shopping for components and I hit a snag. Should I get an ultra or should I get ultra efficient parts and let the NAS run all the time, or should I set up my NAS to shut down without activity and turn on when accessed? If the latter, how do I do that? Are there certain power supplies, hard drives, or other components that are better with a NAS than others? Sign Sean. Well, I gotta say, something you might want to think about is using one of the atom-based machines or one of the sort of you know e-boxes that you know you don't need a lot of power supply to run a home network unless you're unless you're, let me rephrase that unless you plan on transcoding MPEG-4 video for different video devices in your house on the same box on the same <laughs> box you don't need a lot of power if you're just serving the file you, you know you could use like a five-year-old PC you found in the basement if you want to transcode MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 video on the fly then you need a more powerful machine but in any case. Consider both. I mean, I almost never shut down my NAS because I'm afraid that if I shut it down, it won't start back up. I, I have a dedicated <laughs> NAS box, and I essentially have a scheduling system. It has it built in, and I right. can say, hey, you know what? At 3 in the morning, just turn off until, say, 6.30 in the morning at least, so it gives it a break. But yeah. Yeah. otherwise, I've also measured the power directly, power consumption directly right. on the device using something like a kilowatt. It, it, my particular NAS with four drives, and it's consuming about 40 to 50 watts. So 
it's not a lot of power, so I don't mind leaving that yeah, running so all the time. That's less than half an amp. I mean, that's going to be what, like, like twenty bucks a year in your town? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, look, that said, you should always consider getting low energy uh, parts. For example, I said use a five-year-old PC. Try not to use one with a giant, you know, three hundred watt CPU inside of it. And consider getting stuff like uh, Western Digital's Green Drives instead of their more performance-oriented Black Series. Uh, look for an ultra-efficient power supply. One of the nice things about Atom boxes or repurposing old notebooks that happen to have an ESATA port is they tend to use almost no electricity. If you're building a, a box and populating with drives, look for a, an ultra-efficient power supply. It's like 85%, 90%, and isn't rated for more wattage than you need. And do yourself a favor, turn off any non-essential items uh, on the motherboard, like sound. I mean, th that may be a little extreme. I don't yeah. know if you're going to notice that on the kilowatt, but it's, it's, it's a possibility. Definitely, definitely. FreeNAS does support power management spin down times for hard drives. Uh, that's accessible in the menu, and it does support sleep. But make sure you have Wake on LAN enabled in the BIOS if you want it to work over the network. Otherwise, you're going to be really frustrated when you go to download a file and you remember that the NAS is off and you have to run downstairs to the basement where the NAS is and hit the button to power the NAS back up. Um, we haven't tested this personally. Uh, we've heard both pros and cons for keeping FreeNAS on 24-7 and auto-powering it down and up. Your mileage may vary, and as always, back up your data before you build it and stuff it on a new NAS, because it sucks to lose all of your cool files because something went awry. Awry, is that a word? Did yes. Did I pronounce it even remotely connected? Awry. Awry. Awful. <laughs> Exploded. <laughs> Blew up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. For everybody watching, we love on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how to's, you ask us. We'll do it, but we need those emails to guide us. Don't be shy, send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and all the admiration of your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with, quote, video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Have B and G turned off in your Wi-Fi configuration? Yeah, one X versus four X versus sixteen X. You you shouldn't be seeing Hold any on. performance difference on those. Hold on, sorry. Yeah, but I'm just gonna stop here.